not used to having a book in front of me or doing these kinds of commencement talks. I know there's a lot of Laker fans out there that are saying, well, Mitch, if this is not what you're used to doing, exactly what is it you've been doing for the last three years? <laughs> so we've averaged about 20 wins for the last three years. But we are excited about the future. Judy mentioned we have the number two pick. In fact, we worked out two players this morning and we worked out two players yesterday and we're very excited about the draft in two weeks. So uh, this is a break on a Friday afternoon. And once again, for you Laker fans, I'll be working tomorrow and Sunday to make up for being here today. I'm gonna to begin by telling you that it's difficult for me to stand here today on the campus of UCLA. Sure, I'm a little nervous, but that's not the reason. Uh, just under a year ago, actually about a year and a half ago, my daughter, Alina, passed away at UCLA's Children's Hospital. And she would have been 17 a week ago this Sunday. And the memory of her passing is still very raw. Alina bravely battled for over a year and a half before her young body finally gave in. It's too hard to imagine what she went through. When Judy asked me to speak today, I told her how busy this time of year was for me and that I would get back to her. True, it's a busy time of year, but quite frankly, I wasn't sure I had what it would take to return to this campus so close in time and location to the place where the unthinkable took place. My wife and I still struggle to get through each day and always probably will. Thankfully, because my job is full and very busy, it's easier for me to get through the day. My wife is not so lucky as she has to manufacture a full day every day. I'm proud of her strength and her bravery, but quite frankly, I don't know how she does it. We search for answers as to why, but always come up short or empty-handed. My son is completing his freshman year at UCSB and seems to be slowly emerging as an accomplished young man. We're proud of him, but it pains us to see what he's had to go through. As the years pass, he'll remember less of her struggle and more of the good stuff. Alina had it all, and as a family, we miss her terribly. I knew the moment she would ask me to address this year's class what an honor it would be to stand here before you. But I must admit that I'm feeling ill-equipped and underprepared about how to share some of my life's experiences knowing that at the end of the day, I will fall short in explaining all there is to understand about the universe. So I wondered, how can I pass on wisdom for the future when there is so much I don't understand about the past? After much reflection, contemplation, and soul searching, I've come to the conclusion that not knowing all the answers is okay, and that the search for the answers or the strength just to carry on, we'll have to do. So bear down with me as I do the best I can. As my high school coach once said, and you'll hear more about him later, do the thing that's hard to do and the power will come. About a month ago, I contacted Al Osborne, an old friend and a senior associate dean here at Anderson, and asked him for his advice regarding my talk today. He steered me away from preaching to you about addressing the world's problems. In fact, I spoke to a friend today, and um, I told him I was speaking, and he said, well, I've got your opening line. I said, what is it? He said, tell them the world is perfect and don't screw it up. <laughs> Only that wasn't the word he used. Instead, Al Osborne sent me to a video of Steve Jobs addressing Stanford's university talk in 2005. His talk was simple and to the point while focusing on meaningful and special events in his life that shaped who he was at the time. 
His speech got me to thinking about how events in my life altered Steer to help shape my journey to date. Let me start with talking about how I ended up standing before you today. In 1981, I came to play for the Los Angeles Lakers for Washington. I was a highly paid free agent. I signed a long-term contract. I was 27 years old. The team at the time had Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Jamal Wilkes. It was just a star-studded team with a great future. They won an NBA championship in 1980, but lost in 1881. They needed a power forward. That's what I was. And I was chosen as the player they wanted to complete the starting five. Our team started slowly, and the existing coach was replaced by the now legendary Pat Riley, eight games into the season. Immediately, we started winning as everybody clicked under the new coach. I was playing well, and the team was winning. Life was good. Then on December 19th, 21 games into my first season, as we were playing a game in San Diego, my world came to a crashing halt. I was running the floor when I took a pass from Magic and a Clipper player, ironically, Kobe Bryant's dad, Joe, stepped in front of me. As I tried to avoid him, I felt my knee buckle and I fell to the floor. The next day, the doctors told me I had a torn ACL ligament, a broken bone, and damaged cartilage. In the early 80s, medicine had not progressed to the point where this kind of injury could be medically repaired. I had reconstruction surgery five months later and was told if I played again, it would only be after missing two years and lengthy rehabilitation. I was 27 and felt my world slipping away. Knowing that I would miss two seasons and possibly never play again forced me to think beyond my playing days much earlier than I expected. I also wondered how, other than two hours a day in therapy, was I gonna spend the next two years productively? I decided to roll in extension classes at UCLA's business school, at that time called the Graduate School of Management. I didn't know where it would lead, only that I had the time, didn't want to waste two years, and was for forced to think beyond my playing days. While attending class that year, I was introduced to the then admissions director, and the name may ring a bell, Eric Mockover. Incidentally, the same Eric Mako who was honored on the alumni reunion weekend last month for outstanding service. Being a sports fan, Eric, understanding my situation, suggested to me that I apply the following year for admission to the program for the fully employed. I would have four years to complete the program and could continue to rehab my knee at the same time. He figured if I made it back to the court, that would be a bonus, and if I didn't, I would have my UCLA MBA to fall back on. Although I wore a big brace, I lost considerable athleticism. I did make it back and was able to play. My role had changed, but I derived a lot of satisfaction out of being a part of a team that did win a championship in 1985. I continued to go to class and continued the painstakingly slow process of chipping away at my MBA degree while juggling Laker games and practices. Slowly, I made progress. Then in 1986, I re-injured my knee again and retired in the spring when the Laker GM at that time, Jerry West, got tired of me limping up and down the court, or probably more realistically, just wanted the roster space so he could sign Michael Thompson. He asked me to move into the front office, and that was about 30 years ago. Although I'm at peace with my playing career, in many ways it's hard for me to imagine a career after playing being any more satisfying than the one I had. I know with certainty that I would not have gotten the opportunity to move into the front office without having attended the business school at UCLA. I also know I would not have gotten enrolled for my MBA without Eric Mockover's encouragement and guidance. And most assuredly, I would not have enrolled at UCLA had I not injured my knee. In many ways, one of the worst things that could ever happen to me turned out to be one of the best. Thank you, Eric Mockover. I'm a Yankee fan, so every now and then you're gonna hear me quote Yogi Berra. And those of you who knew Yogi Berra knew his quotes were pretty different. If you don't know where you were going, you might end up someplace else. Now I'd like to talk about three other people other than my mom and dad who helped me the most in my life. 
My high school coach, Mr. Kellner. The spring of 1969, my, my junior high days were quickly coming to a close. Summer was a few weeks away and I couldn't wait. Like most kids, I had no plans, but looked forward to a summer of hanging out with my friends. Unlike most kids, I was 6'8", growing like a weed and got awfully skinny. I weighed about 150 pounds soaking wet. My clothes didn't fit, and I stood at least 14 inches above my classmates. I was self-conscious, lacked confidence and direction. Baseball was my lifetime love, but my body wasn't built for the game. As I grew, so did the strike zone. And as my strike zone grew, my playing days came to an end. One day towards the end of my ninth grade year, I was asked to step out of a classroom to meet a man named Mr. Kellner. He was the high school basketball coach and word had traveled to him that there was a 6'8 kid at the local junior high. Mr. Kellner had a reputation of being hard-nosed, intense, and disciplined. As he lectured me in the hallway, I got the feeling this wasn't gonna be a good talk. He was very intense and stood so close to me that when he spoke, I could feel his breath and his spit hitting my face. He had a deep voice and at 6'3", 220 pounds, physically imposing. I felt cornered. As he spoke, his index finger repeatedly hit my chest whenever he tried to make a point. He was passionate and demanding as to why I should play basketball, and in particular, why I should commit my upcoming summer to basketball and basketball camp. At this point, I wanted the conversation to end and get on with my summer plans. After about 15 minutes, the class bell rang and the halls began to fill up. I vividly remember being trapped, talking to this man in the hallway, filled and with all my friends passing by, wondering what was going on between this man and myself. He never lost eye contact with me and continued to hammer away about what he wanted me to do this summer. He wouldn't let up as the bell rang yes again. After about 30 minutes, he finally relented and let me go. I had sweated through my shirt and I had a headache. All I could think about was this guy is trying to ruin my summer. That evening I walked into my house and my mom told me that her Mr. Kellner called her and spoke to her for over 30 minutes on the phone about me attending basketball camp that summer. All I could think to say was, Mom, this Mr. Kellner guy is trying to ruin my summer. At which time my mom turned to me and said, Sounds to me like he sees something in you that even I didn't see. So as my mom turned away, I climbed the stairs to my bedroom. I stepped inside, closed the door, and sat on the side of the bed and stared out to the window onto the street below. After a couple of minutes, my dad pulled up in his station wagon after a day on a construction site somewhere in New York City. I watched him get out of the car and slowly walk up the driveway. His overalls and hands were dirty, and he looked beat. Unbeknownst to him, I watched him until he disappeared through the front door. Another yogiism. When you come to the fork in the road, take it. My college coach, Dean Smith. In 1974, my sophomore year at North Carolina, we were playing our last regular season game against Duke University. If you follow college basketball, you know how big that game is. As the game began to come to a close, we found ourselves down by eight points with 16 seconds to go. The faithful began to file out of Carmichael Auditorium with their heads down, rushing to beat the traffic. My college coach, Dean Smith, called a timeout after my teammate, Bobby Jones, was fouled. As we sat in silence, unexpectedly, Coach Smith began to smile and looked each of us in the eye and said, isn't this a great situation to be in? Look around. Everyone in this building is leaving and giving up on you. He smiled again and said, we're gonna win this game and it's gonna be one of the greatest comebacks of all time. We heard what he was saying I'm not sure at that point we believed him, but it was the unexpected smile that got our attention, as if he knew something we didn't know. 
He called out the defense and said, after Bobby makes the free throws, steal the inbounds pass and score and call timeout. Well, Bobby made both free throws. We stole the inbounds pass, scored and called the timeout. So now we're down by four with about six seconds left. We sat there a second time and Coach Smith gave us the defense and told us to do the same thing with a different defense. Uh, all the defenses were numbered. He was a math major. He had a master's in math. And all the assistants had masters in math. As we were leaving the huddle, he confidently smiled once again. Well, we stole the ball again, scored. Now we're down two with three seconds to play. Timeout, North Carolina. Duke came out in the ball and we fouled right away. Even though we fouled Duke's best free throw shooter, he somehow missed the front end of a one and one We grabbed the rebound and called our last timeout. At this time, the energy on the bench and in the building was surging. The crowd that began to leave 10 minutes ago was now scrambling to get back in the building as word of the come, comeback began to spread. On the next play, play we inbounded the ball from under the Duke basket. Believe it or not, Coach Smith remembered I had played baseball in junior high. So he asked me to throw a baseball pass to midcourt on a play we worked on in practice every day of every year. A freshman and future NBA All-Star named Walter Davis caught the ball at midcourt, took two dribbles and launched a 35-footer. Back in, back in the dark ages, we didn't have a three-point shot. So that shot was for the tie. As the clock hit zero, the ball softly kissed off the glass and into the basket. The crowd erupted, great celebration, and we went on to win the game in overtime and complete one of the all-time greatest comebacks in college basketball. From that day going forward as a team, we never again questioned our ability to win a game. Even though we were always prepared, it was Coach Smith's calm, smile, and confidence in the face of a likely defeat that served as a lesson in life to never give up. Another yogiism, it ain't over till it's over. And lastly, my mentor, Jerry West. Early in my tenure as an assistant GM, we were preparing for the 1989 NBA draft. The NBA had yet to embrace foreign players. I think at that time, there might have been one or two players not born in the United States playing. Today, a third of the NBA are foreign NBA players. We had the 26th pick in the draft and had heard about a Yugoslavian player who was 19 years old. Nobody amongst our staff had seen him and all we had was a grainy film that ran about two minutes. The Yugoslavian was over seven feet tall, young and from what we can tell, talented. There was also a rumor that if you drafted him, he would have to serve in the military first. The American players that we were considering were not as talented but of course would not have to serve in the military and we also knew them very well. Draft day came and our two scouts, Jerry West and I, assembled in our war room in preparation for the conference call that finalized the draft. We had narrowed our choice down to two, the Yugoslavian and a much scouted seven foot American who played four years of college ball. As our turn to pick neared, the discussion heated up and there was no clear consensus. In the sports world, the moment of truth had arrived. Jerry went down the line and asked each of us for our votes. The other two scouts and I voted for the American and gave our reasons why. With only seconds left to make our decision, Jerry leaned into the speaker phone and said the Los Angeles Lakers select Vladi Divac from Yugoslavia. He then looked at us and said his talent outraised the risk. He's just too good to pass on. And with that, he stood up and left the room. So the three of us were shaken and left to wonder why we were even there. What purpose had we served if Jerry didn't listen to us or knew all along that he wanted to take someone else? Well, the player the other two scouts and I voted for ended up being a journeyman, and, the, and Jerry's selection ended up in the Hall of Fame. At a later date, Jerry shared with me that he did in fact value our input and recommendations but that he just had a feeling in his gut to take Vlade and that a big part of his responsibility as GM was to take the risk as he felt that it was a good one. He said as a leader, 
if you are afraid to go against the grain, you will almost always end up in the middle of the pack. You can observe a lot by watching Yogi Berra. If it's not clear by now, my message for the day is simple. We are shaped by our life experiences. Every person you meet, or any event in life, no matter how meaningless it may seem at the time, may at some point help shape who you are or who you may become. Conversely, every encounter someone else has with you can shape who they may become. It could be as simple as a hallway encounter when you're 14 years old, or as memorable as a college game when you're down by eight with 16 seconds to go. Perhaps the business meeting where your boss ignores your advice and fearlessly makes an unexpected decision. And lastly, if the powers from above throw you a curve and you just can't figure out why, remember you're not alone and somehow you must find the strength to carry on. Do the thing that's hard to do and the power will come. And when you come to the fork in the road, take it. Thank you, congratulations, and good luck to you all.